In this video lecture, we're going to answer the question, or to start to answer the question, when will I know that I am called and ready uh, to plant churches? This is in that envisioning phase where uh, still discerning what uh, God is up to with your life. Uh, we talked last week about uh, just why there's a need for new churches in North America and uh, having a, a heart behind saturating uh, cities and communities and countries with the gospel. Um, first and foremost, before planting churches, but now uh, in the envisioning phase, as that uh, core value foundation is set, you start to move into, okay, well, is God actually calling me to this task? And so we're going to talk about a lot of things today uh, around just calling and getting ready. Uh, just at that very initial phase, this is where uh, my wife and I were about three and a half years ago when um, we were at a church planting church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina as members. We were leading a small group. I was getting mentored by the uh, elders there uh, to one day be ready for church planting, but we didn't know where, when, or how. And uh, But God started opening up some doors for us to move to Calgary. And so uh, as we started exploring that option and visiting, uh, we got into this uh, getting ready phase. And so we want to discuss just what is that? It's, it's really just the, the very initial. It's, it's God has given me this idea in my mind. And I kind of we went last week. Uh, we discussed the, the actual phases to do uh, to to start a new church and to plant churches. And so, with that in mind, okay, so what what do I do next? What's kind of like that initial preparation before we even move or before we even really start gathering a core team, that sort of thing? So I uh, wanted to discuss that uh, today. We're gonna look at four uh, main areas, four main things today uh, in this getting ready, and we'll uh, address. Uh, calling. Uh, there's another video you're watching uh, this week in class that is all about Am I Called to Be a Church Planter? Uh, featuring uh, Pastor uh, and Executive Director of Christ Together, Will Plitt. So that's another uh, video completely about calling. So we're going to touch it here, but that video focuses more on it than this one. Uh, this one will, but we're going to talk about the assessment process of uh, uh, being assessed to see if you're ready. We're going to talk about apprenticing pathways. Uh, then we'll discuss some academic platforms and then affirming person. So yes, I love alliteration. It's kind of old school, but I love it. So the AP, when I started working this out, it made me happy uh, that I could alliterate it. So anyways, just put up with it. You'll live. Um, so first of all, the assessment uh, process. So uh, potential church planners and their sending churches, they're sending uh, you out, uh, benefit greatly from going through uh, a thorough assessment of their calling, character, and capacity for the work of church planting. Uh, an assessment is basically uh, a, a, a test that lasts a good while, several months usually, uh, of people looking at you, of questions you're answering, interviews, there's all kind of different components that go into it, but no matter what it looks like, because each church is different, each denomination or church planting network or mission agency may do this differently, but it's a great benefit to go through this. Um, I actually went through two levels, uh, two kinds of assessment uh, before God opened up a door for us to plant a church. I went through an assessment with a local church there in Winston who uh, assessed me to see if I was ready to join like a church planting internship residency. And then later, about two years later, when uh, the door started to open, or at least we could see the door opening for Calgary, I was assessed through the North American Mission Board. Um, and it was about a four-month process as well. Uh, so I've been, gone through two different types of assessment, and both were beneficial because they expose things in your life that say, you know what, I, if I can't get this area of my life right, then I may not be ready to plant a church yet. And the assessment process is not this um, uh, negative experience where you just grilled and say, oh, you just definitely can't plant a church. You have no talent for anything. It's really just for your own benefit to see, you know, is this really what God has in mind? Is this how he has wired me? And um, I've, I've had several friends and now being, uh, I help with the assessment uh, uh, center here in Calgary with our mission board. Um, I help direct some things. And we have had uh, uh, planters come through who really wanted to plant a church. They, they really felt like I was calling them. But after the assessment process and several months and the interviews and all these things and really trying to care for uh, this couple, um, it was evident that they just weren't ready. It doesn't mean that they never will be involved in church planning. It just means now is the not uh, now is not the right time. They may need a little bit more training, a little more preparation, just maybe some family issues they need to resolve before they step into a church planting role. So it's a great benefit to going through the assessment uh, process. Uh, here's an example of the full process. Um, this is actually from the North American Mission Board. I know I mentioned a lot, but it's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, it's through the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and so this is the mission board that I went through in order to come here to Calgary. 
other churches and mission agencies and denominations have their own, but they, they essentially have this same kind of uh, pathway. It's really not that uh, different between each. Some do it better than others, um, and uh, uh, it's been a really neat thing to see in the last 10, 15 years. Assessment has become a very important factor in starting new churches because uh, I've heard stories from professors of years ago when a mission board or a denomination or church would give a lot of money to a very excited uh, church planter, and they would go and within two years it failed because they would never assess to see if they actually qualified or could handle the work of church planting. Uh, they never had any kind of real mentoring or training for it. They would just give us some money and a blessing um, and a pat on the back and say, hey, go plant your church. And there was a time where the majority of church plants were failing, not surviving. Where now that has flipped, where the vast majority of about 80% now are surviving and thriving uh, when once those numbers were flipped. So this is a process that the North, North American Mission Board uh, uh, has their planters go through, and I've gone through this uh, complete uh, process. Uh, they go through an assessment time, which we're focusing on today. Then there's an orientation. The orientation was basically uh, two days in Atlanta, Georgia, with about a hundred other uh, church planters at the same stage that we were in. They had very much just moved to their cities or were just getting started. They'd gone through assessment, but the church hasn't started yet. So the orientation was really just kind of this rallying point, building a sense of, of uh, brotherhood uh, between the different planters. Uh, so that's kind of the orientation, uh, and it was about a two-day thing. The assessment itself was about four months. Orientation was about two. It was just a two-day event. The training was a six-month training that I did on-site here in the city of Calgary with four other uh, 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 pastor planters here in the city, three others who were planting and the one pastor who was leading it. So I went through a train and then I stepped into, and actually during that time, uh, um, at the same time of going through the training, I also started an apprenticeship for a year with a local church here in Calgary where the pastors there um, spent a year uh, mentoring and discipling us. We actually planted out of their church. So I'm actually still a member of Tapestry Church, though in right now, a week and a half from now, uh, we'll be launching Hope Church and starting it officially. And so I've gone through the coaching uh, under our local church here. And then now I'm in this uh, phase of getting this pastoral care. The mission board uh, uh, has a great uh, care system in place. And they also have local leaders here in the city through the mission board and through other churches whose uh, focus is to take care of planting and their families and so they uh, just a two weeks ago they provided this family fun day for church plans where they paid for everything a great meal um, and then they have uh, counseling that they provide uh, that the mission board actually cover if something happens in our family that we need some um, some counseling help with so there's so a lot of things so that's kind of the full process I'm sorry I'm saying process and process uh, Calgary is a process, and I'm used to process in the States, so I apologize for that. I'm still learning my Canadian English. Um, so here are, um, sorry that kind of bled down there. Uh, this is 10 life, 10 life areas to assess for church uh, planting. Number one is calling, and like I said, another video handling that. We want to do, uh, talk about that briefly in just a minute. Emotional and spiritual health, family dynamic, vision, leadership, communication, missional engagement, disciple-making, social skills, and theological conviction. Those are generally the 10 areas that a church, uh, that a, uh, an assessment will involve, whether it's done through a local church, a denominational group, a church network, a mission agency. Uh, they will most likely assess you in most or all of these areas. So let's look at those. Uh, let's look at each in a little more detail. First calling. Uh, demonstrates uh, this the person, the candidate will say, demonstrates the ability to clearly convey their salvation experience and personal calling to church planting and seeks a growing personal relationship with Christ. The question I would ask here is, does your calling sound more like your own or God? So a quick personal story. When I was a student at Piedmont in my second year during a missions conference, uh, one of the speakers came and spoke and uh, talked about church planting in North America in the U.S. And it was the first time I really thought that. I was from a very small town in North Carolina. My dad was a pastor of a very small Baptist church. And uh, we didn't know about church planting. We knew about church splitting, but not church planting, unless it was done overseas. You know, we plant churches in other countries. You don't need to do that here because this church is everywhere. But it was the first time that my my thinking was really challenged on that. Uh, and I started to get excited about the, the, the uh, prospect of actually starting a church one day, started looking into what was happening both in my area and around the U.S., and there were a lot of exciting things, this is 13, 14 years ago, a lot of exciting things in the church planning realm, and I got caught up in it, and my vision for or what I felt called to do um, was, uh, I, I, I got to go plant churches now. I'm at Piedmont getting a youth ministry degree, but I need to go do this, and um 
it was obvious at the time that was not what God was calling me to do. Um, I had a very me-centered idea of my calling. It, it was basically me saying, man, if I could have it, I'm tired of these boring churches that I just don't get anything out of, and they're not doing anything to help people, yada, yada. I had all these disagreements with churches that were very sinful of me, um, but I was basically calling myself into church planting. It wasn't until almost a decade later that God actually stepped in and the calling was very real and evident that it was church planting. Um, and so just ask yourself that question, that question. Does your calling sound more like your own or does it sound like God's? Um, here's a, a few scriptures uh, related to calling um, that I want us to discuss, both from, both from the book of Matthew. This is Matthew 20, uh, 22 or 23. Uh, this is uh, Jesus being approached by uh, uh, somebody in the crowd says, Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? Very familiar passage. He said to them, He, Jesus, said to them, uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So here we see Jesus himself when he says, What is the command in the law that is the greatest? Uh, we can say that we're called to obey Christ's command. I think we can agree with that. Uh, and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, I would say first and foremost, your calling is to these two verses. Now, there are a lot of other things. It's called to holiness. I think holiness is what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. I think that is personal holiness. Um, Love your neighbor as yourself. That is a call to mission. There's another verse, very popular, the Great Commission passage, Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, his disciples, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here, the calling for the disciples was primarily to go and make disciples. So I wanted to discuss primary calling versus vocational calling because um, when I was a student at Piedmont, I got really caught up in what I thought was my calling. And, I, and this is not what Piedmont communicated by any means. It's what I just kind of thought in my mind seemed to be the norm. And it was like, oh, you either call to youth ministry, you call to be a pastor, call to be a missionary, call to be a Christian school teacher, call to be whatever. And this is before Piedmont had leadership and business degrees and nonprofit degrees. There's a lot more degree options now than when I was there 13, 14 years ago. So we had all these uh, uh, ministry areas, and I really thought my primary calling was to just find one of those and stick with it. Oh, I, I, I can't do anything other than youth ministry. But what I missed was that Jesus, is, Jesus actually called his disciples to love God, love others, and make disciples. That was it. And how that looked was different for every person. So I would say your primary calling by God is to love him, love others, and reproduce disciples who will do the same. That's your primary calling. As a Christian, this is your calling. But there's another level of calling, because we talk about calling in church life so much. And I'd like to just clarify, your vocational calling, what you do as your job, your actual ministry, where you go each day for uh, your your office or your, your role, what it, your vocational calling is the specific assignment God gives you through His grace to make disciples who live their primary calling. So God, first and foremost, calls us to love Him, love others, make disciples. Let's say that that is our first and foremost calling, and it doesn't matter what I like to say this, God has called me to make disciples and to love him, love others. He just so happened uh, to choose for me to do that as a church planter in Calgary, Canada. But it's going to look different for different stages of life. That may evolve. That may change. So if your primary calling, you realize, is love God, love others, is a great commission, then you can understand better your, your, your vocational calling doesn't have to be so specific. You may say, I want to be involved in church planting, but I don't feel called to be a lead church planter. Great. Because your primary calling is not to be a lead church planter. Your primary calling is to love God, love others, and reproduce more disciples. So I want to separate uh, and just kind of show the, distinct, uh, the, the differences between your primary calling and your vocational calling. Vocational is a very specific assignment, and that assignment can change. But if you're always anchored in the fact that your primary calling is to love God, love others, make disciples, then you can go to your vocational calling anywhere, and it doesn't really matter what that looks like. I think there's a lot more... And, you know, people, we get we get stuck in saying God has called me to this very, very, we get very specific with what we say God has called us to. I would say the only specific thing God has called us to is our primary calling. I think the vocational is quite open. I think at this point right now, I could have been just as obedient to God by planting a church in a different city 
or staying in Winston, the job I was, because I was making disciples through my local church. I was uh, I was trying to live out my primary calling. I don't think I would have been disobedient, but God made it very clear that my next assignment was to church plan in Calgary. So I just trusted his wisdom, trusted others giving advice and counsel and a lot of prayer, discernment, conversations with my wife and other family members. And it was very evident that God desired my vocational calling uh, to be as a church planter in Calgary with our change and be different for each of us. So what should I do? Here's a um, question. What should I do if I have a passion for church planting, but I don't feel called vocationally to being a church planter or any other vocational minister? So uh, I had you fill out the uh, info, student info survey at the beginning of this uh, course uh, to get to know you a little bit more um, and to find out what if you're involved in a church planning church or not, your role in your current church, and what you aspire to be. And uh, I wasn't surprised a bit because it's like this every semester. The majority of you, the vast majority of you taking this class do not feel called right now to vocationally be a church planter. And that's great. Because God's going to call you and lead you to something else to live out your primary calling. But there were so many of you who uh, on that form said, um, I don't feel called to this, but I still want to be involved in church planning. I still want to uh, help in some way. And so here's what I think. Uh, and some of you may not even feel like, I don't, even want, I don't want to be a pastor. I don't want to be a worship leader. I don't want my job to be at a local church. I just want to learn the Bible, be faithful. Great. Go and find, go go follow whatever career path God wants you to have and live out your primary calling wherever He is. And if you get to, I would advise and, and, and encourage to do it with a actively church planting church, either a new church plant or one that is actively trying. I think there's a lot of benefit to that, which we want to cover in just a minute. So, what should I do if I have a passion for church planting but don't feel vocationally called to being a church planter or any other vocational minister that? I think Daniel, Daniel Eam has a lot of wisdom. Uh, for us here. He says, the better question that we need to answer is, am I called to be about church planting? If you're a follower of Christ, the answer is a default yes. I would say every Christian should be called to be about church planting, regardless of your job, regardless of your role at your local church. You're, you should feel a calling to be about, because as we discussed in the, the first week's lecture, we talked about what is church planting? What is the Bible never, Jesus, Jesus never said, go plant churches. But he said, go and make disciples, the Great Commission. And the book of Acts is very clear that the natural byproduct, the outcome of the disciples of Christ living out the Great Commission faithfully was new churches had to be started. Okay, So church planting should be, be part of our theological conviction and the reality of us living out the Great Commission. is very clear in the book of Acts. And so we should all be called to be about church planting. That's going to take on so many different forms, so many different ways for you to be involved. So if you're taking this class and you will never once uh, be a lead church planter like I am, great. Be faithful to your primary calling and be faithful to your calling to be about church planting. Uh, the second one, emotional and spiritual health. Uh, this person demonstrates this is the second um, area of life um, to be assessed in. They, they assess your calling. So uh, during in, in the assessment process, you're being asked a lot of questions. You're being interviewed by others. There's a lot of things that they're just trying to assess and through questions and interviews and other things, your uh, background, your thoughts on these uh, different topics of calling is number one. Second is usually your emotional and spiritual health. Uh, this person demonstrates a willingness to prioritize personal health and constantly looks for personal improvement, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Let me tell you, if you're an emotional wreck, you don't need to be planning a church. It will wreck your emotions for you. Trust me, I'm there right now. Uh, spiritually speaking, if your spiritual life is not where it needs to be, your relationship with God is not good, it will not get better when you start, step into a church planting position or uh, step into helping a church. It will only get tough because Satan does not want that new church uh, to be started. Are you taking care of yourself physically? Are you physic uh, physically able to be a part of the work of church planting, especially if you're a lead pastor? Uh, it will be e it will be physically draining on you, uh, with a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of just busy, tough work that goes involved in getting a church started. It is physically uh, demanding as well. So here's a question: Will you be honest with yourself, your family, your church, and your assessors and your church plant about your struggles, emotionally, physically, and spiritually? Will you be honest with with others and yourself about those so that you can get the help? Um, both before, during, and after uh, you're helping plant a new church. Third is family dynamic. 
Uh, does the candidate, the prospective church planter, demonstrate the ability to be the spiritual leader in a family and establishes appropriate boundaries for the family in relation to the church plant? Uh, this is very tough uh, to do depending on if you have kids in the home, if you're single. Every family, every, every family dynamic is very different. But do you have the ability to lead your family uh, spiritually? Do you have those boundaries in place where you're protecting your time uh, with your spouse? You're protecting your time with your kids and your, even your extended family. Uh, question here is, will you prioritize shepherding your family above shepherding a church? Um, that's very tough because church planting ministry, any type of vocational ministry, will take a lot of your physical and emotional energy. Uh, so will you prioritize shepherding your family above shepherding your church? And I promise you this is quite tough, um, but it's uh, also very biblical. Number four, vision. This person has captured a compelling faith-inspired vision for their life and ministry, which they can articulate effectively in a variety of settings. And then the question here is, is your vision for ministry you centered or Christ? Kind of like your calling is, what do you want to see happen? I wanted to have uh, this years ago in, in, uh, when I was at Piedmont as a student, I wanted to have the cool church. My vision was to have the coolest church in town so everyone would come to it. I had no vision for lost coming to Christ. I had no vision for saturating a city with the gospel. I had a vision for Dustin looking great on stage. That was it. And it's really, it's comical now to laugh at. Uh, probably why all my buddies in the dorm laughed at me at that point. I get it. Um, but I had a very me-centered vision. But now God, and through through His grace, through a lot of good mentoring, involvement, and some very deeply gospel-centered churches, really shaped me these last four or five years to show God's vision for your city is that His glory uh, be his, for that city to be filled with His glory, for more worshipers to be multiplied, more disciples made. That that is that's why in this the lecture and the, the week before this we we spent a time in the lectures of what does God desire? Does He desire for us to plant churches? Not necessarily. That's not the primary. He's primary. He wants to see every man, woman, and child have these repeat opportunity to hear, see, and respond to the gospel. And so, if that is your vision, then it, it will affect everything else in your church plan. So, can you can you do you understand this vision? Can you articulate that to someone when you're trying to recruit someone to join your church plan? And they say, "Oh, well, tell me the vision of your church. What do you want to see happen?" And you say, "I want a great stage to people can hear my awesome sermons." That person is not going to join your launch team, okay? It's just not going to happen. That is not a compelling vision. I, I am not a compelling person. The vision that you come up with is not a compelling vision, but God's vision is a very compelling vision. And how you live that out in your specific context with how God has wired you and who God has brought you, that is where uh, you really see God's vision uh, come into play and really be lived out. Um, in this class, uh, like I just mentioned through the surveys, uh, there are different ones of you interested in different things. And one of the questions I ask is, is um, are you interested in church planting, church revitalization, that sort of thing? Um, what, do you, what do you see your role being? And so here are the kind of four things that throughout this class, now this class is about planting churches, okay? The, it's the practical class on that. But not everyone watching this and taking this course wants to be a church planter, but you're taking it because there's something uh, that you desire to learn about church planting in general. So in the course, we'll talk a lot about the lead church planter, what it means to have that role. We'll talk a lot about that as well. But we also want to talk about the different other ways of being involved in church planting. Uh, so here are the different, I call them the vision types, the types of uh, churches. If you want to see a man, woman, child, have repeat opportunity to hear us and respond to the gospel, then we need to focus on not just church planting. That's one section. So here are the four vision types that we'll really discuss. I think they'll fit everyone in this class and anyone else watching this video. Uh, church planting in strategic context. We're going to cover some of you really want to be that uh, you, you, you feel led by God vocationally, out of your primary calling to help start a new church one day as a lead pastor, as uh, like a co-pastor, whatever it is. Church planting is on your heart. This is what was on my heart became uh, my vocational calling. But for some of you, number two, church revitalization is, is on your heart. Uh, you really desire to have church revitalized for a renewed purpose, to see this congregation that's been struggling and declining for years be revitalized, have new life brought in through evangelism, discipleship, and community engagement, and loving the lost, all these type of things. I have a really good friend of mine, so he, was a, he was my pastor years ago, and he's no, no longer the pastor there, um, but he has a heart for revitalizing churches in the southern U.S. where there's so many churches, and nearly 80% are in decline and dying. He is burdened for that. He wants to help churches stop the bleeding and get back to growth, no matter how old the church is, no matter, uh, excuse me, no matter if they have <clears throat> brick building in a tall steeple, 
and the <clears throat> more traditional. That does not matter. He wants to help see new churches be revitalized. And so in this class, we're going to draw, bring in references and, and help those of you who want to revitalize. There are a lot of these principles in this class throughout this whole course that you could easily take uh, from church planting to church, church revitalization is not that different. You're just starting off in a little bit different way. And so we want to talk about that kind of vision time. Maybe that's where God is leading you to be a part of uh, the Great Commission gospel saturation in your area. Maybe it's through church revitalization, not necessarily church planting. So we'll cover that in this class. Or maybe you're at the stage where you need to replant a church. This happens when a church just kind of gets stuck and they don't know what to do. And revitalization can take on many different forms. And one way of revitalization is to really just replant. Some churches some churches will replant with maybe a different name, a different focus, a different vision, different location. There's different ways of replanting. But the, the idea is there's it's, it's the same church just starting something different um, in order to kind of refresh the mission uh, with the people. Um you're probably familiar um, uh, with the Summit Church in Raleigh, Durham, with Pastor J.D. Greer. He's now the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, his mother was my biology teacher at Piedmont. He actually, uh, J.D. Greer, grew up in Salem Baptist Church across the street there from the campus of Piedmont. Um, but he was uh, a pastor on staff at what was Homestead Heights Baptist Church there in the Raleigh, Durham area. And they asked him to be the pastor, and he said, yes, if we can replant as a new church. And so they took that group. The, the, the church who was there, and they came up with a very new mission, new strategy, new name, new programs. Everything just changed because what they're doing wasn't quite working. And so under his leadership, his vision was to really replant. And so that's what they did and refresh a mission. Now they're about a 10,000-member church, have several campuses across Raleigh and Durham, and have planted almost 30-something churches across the U.S. in the last decade. Uh, so doing a phenomenal job for the Great Commission, but they were a replant. So some of you, that's more your heart in this class. Um, you may even want to go, and that's your vocational calling, is to replant a church one day. And so I think this class will help you as well in the practical steps because you'll follow you basically follow the same phases of starting a new church. You'll follow them for revitalizing a church and follow them for replanting a church. You're just adjusting the questions. And the last thing is for church strengthening through missional partnerships and shared learning. Some of you may be pastoring a church or you're a member of a church or you're a youth pastor or something and you just want your church to be involved in church planting or whatever that looks like. Well, this class will help you figure that out. Maybe you're a pastor and you would like to recruit a church planter to come and uh, spend the year in your church learning and then you bless and send him with resources and people People, um, and to plant a church uh, right down the road or in another city or state or something else. And so um, I think church planning will sh can strengthen your church the more that your church is involved. So I think you'll learn something from this class as well. But all of these, no matter what you do, no matter these vocational callings, so to speak, all should focus on saturating communities, cities, and countries with the gospel. And that is what we're talking about, vision. Uh, the fifth area you're being assessed with during the assessment uh, process is your leadership. Uh, does this person demonstrate the ability to draw others to themselves and empower and equip them toward achieving specific goals? We can have a whole class on leadership and church planting and what it means to reproduce more leaders and taking care of yourself. But here are five things that um, I was challenged with by a mentor of mine uh, about two years ago. Uh, we're talking about leadership as a pastor mainly, <clears throat> but I think this fits for every believer as well. Can you lead yourself, that emotional, spiritual health? Can you lead others? Can you start a small group? Can you lead a discipleship or evangelism team? Uh, okay, and then can you lead? Can you lead others? Uh, discipleship relationships. Can you lead teams, uh, groups? Can you lead leaders? Can you actually coach and lead other leaders who would do the job that you once did? Um, and so we can actually multiply that endeavor. And can you lead communities? Can you uh, actually step with other pastors if that's your role, or other Christians? Say, how can we as churches here in this city work together to see uh, our city, our community, our our side of town? Um, filled with uh, the hope of Christ. Uh, number six, communication. Uh, people listen to and respond to them in and out of the pulpit. Uh, there's more to communication and church planning than just preaching behind the pulpit. I've been communicating a vision for this new church here in Calgary for 19 months. And I've been communicating this vision that God has given, but I have not been behind the pulpit to do that. We haven't had the pulpit. That starts in a few weeks. And so will people listen to and be compelled by how you communicate? So here's the question. Are you fluent in the gospel regardless of the setting? Are you able to sit down with 
whoever you're, uh, whether it's a lost person who has no clue about God, or maybe it's a disgruntled Christian who is looking for a new church, or it's a pastor who thinks your competition comes down, whatever it is, are you fluent enough in the gospel to where the gospel is just kind of coming through as you're answering and having any type of conversation? Um, are you fluent in the gospel? Uh, another course, the disciple-making course that uh, is also part of this church plan minor, covers what we call gospel fluency, being able to converse um, about anything with the gospel just threaded throughout it. Uh, but are you able to communicate and uh, even go into a preaching type or teaching type of mode? If you're not going to be the lead pastor, like I'm not going to have a preaching ministry per se, but I'm still going to be involved in planting churches, you're still going to be communicating. Whether you're a kids director, you're communicating to leaders, you're communicating to kids. Uh, whether you're the volunteer coordinator, you're still communicating. Are you able to do that well? Number seven, missional engagement. This person demonstrates a bold drive to share their faith with others in order to expose them to the gospel and lead them to a personal relationship with Christ. Here's the question. Are you comfortable around lost people? I moved to a city that is 95% lost. I have to become comfortable with lost people in my home, at lunches, coffee shops. I have to be comfortable with them, even though I disagree uh, with everything. They're, a lot of what they're doing as, as, as in their lives. I need to be broken harder for them and not judgmental. So are you comfortable around lost people? Do you say, no, I can't go uh, hang out with uh, Thomas tonight because you know he might have a beer and he might cuss a little bit or he might... Whatever it is, well, I was kind of, I kind of grew up thinking, oh, we can't be around lost people because they might rub off. Here's a problem: Jesus was around lost people a lot. So, are you comfortable around lost people? Not to let them rub off and them change your behavior, but for you to create space by being around them in order to earn the right to share the gospel with them. So I think that's what's needed, especially as a church planter. You have to be very comfortable around lost people. Uh, number eight, disciple making. Does this person demonstrate an ability to develop and implement an intentional discipleship process? We talked about the discipleship process in the other disciple making class. So if uh, you do not have that class, uh, the videos are actually on YouTube under my page. You can look through that. Um, but the question I want to ask for here, especially when you're being assessed, is have you actually been discipled yourself to make, mature, and multiply more disciples? I was never really discipled by anyone. Um, my discipleship was, um, I was just expected to show up to youth group. And as long as I did that, I should be an okay Christian, right? Um, but I was never actually sat down and intentionally discipled in order to reproduce another disciple. So do you have a process for doing that? Do you have the ability to do that? And have you had that done uh, to you yourself? Number nine, social skills. This person demonstrates personal initiative to make new friendships and welcome others while also avoiding inappropriate responses to conflict and disagreement. Do you just simply have good social skills to handling? Because I'll tell you, in the church planning ministry, I've gone from being an ice shrink coordinator, sitting on a community association board, meeting with city councilors, meeting with boards of foundations, uh, hanging out, uh, talking with uh, homeless people downtown about the gospel, um, being part of soccer leagues, coaching soccer leagues, uh, running a kite festival, running soccer, all these different hats I've had to wear as a church planter along with my other team. If we didn't have some type of social skills, no one's going to come and it doesn't give us a platform for sharing the gospel. So do you have the drive to actually make these new friendships with others? It doesn't mean you have to be an extrovert. I'm a high extrovert. I... I I have no problem going up to a stranger and having a conversation and then inviting them over for dinner later. Drives my wife nuts. She's an introvert. She's like, don't invite them to dinner. We don't even know them. You know, like, hey, they're just new friends. They come. It's very different. But regardless of whether you're an extrovert or introvert, you still have social skills. And you use those based on your personality. Use that to your uh, advantage. And are you able to avoid these inappropriate responses? Are you, do, you, do you think through before you comment on Facebook? Or do you think through um, and let the gospel uh, fluency um, actually impact how you respond to somebody, um, especially in a conflict or a disagreement. The question here is, are you self-aware of your personal prejudices against people not like you? Um, I know in, in the U.S. especially, and there's a good bit of it here in Canada as well, uh, there's a lot of racial tension happening on the North American continent right now. And it's been happening for uh, centuries. And uh, even uh, just uh, a couple of days ago, um, things were uh, released about... Uh, Nike signing on Colin Kaepernick about uh, this agreement and he became the face of it and depending on whose Facebook post you look at, they're clapping in celebration or boycotting Nike. Um, you ask me what I'm doing, I'm still wearing my Nikes. Um, but are you self-aware that you actually have personal prejudices? It may not be so much racially driven, but it could be, oh, that homeless person. Or, I don't even like being around rich people. 
they just are normal. Or people of a different country, different language, certain. There's all we have all kinds of prejudices, and I really was not. I, I can't, it's, it's, it's impossible to say you're fully ever aware of that because your prejudices keep you from um, seeing that within yourself. But living in Canada, which is a very pluralistic, diverse place, where so many different countries and backgrounds and faiths kind of mingle into one area, more so than any other place I've ever been to on earth, um, I realized that I had a lot of prejudices, and simple things I said were quite prejudiced. And, um, you know, it always tickles, not tickles me, kind of annoys me, but you know, people say, I'm not racist, but you probably sound like it. So we just need to be self aware of our prejudices against people not like us because in church planting you want to meet a lot of people not like you from christian to non-christian your skin color to a different skin color your socioeconomic status to another your education level they're going to be different and can you actually interact with them so you'll be assessed on on that as well and lastly your theological conviction last but definitely not least a person demonstrates a healthy knowledge of the scriptures can articulate essential tenets of the christian faith and lives accordingly to the identity of Christ. Not only do they have this healthy knowledge of scriptures and believe it, they can articulate these essential tenets. And I'm not saying you have to go into the deep, deep depths of superlapsarianism that you're learning in the Theology for Christ there at Piedmont. I have not had a lost person here in Calgary even say anything close and ask that kind of question. The question I get is, why did God let my dad die when I was seven? That's why I'm not a Christian, so can you answer that? Has scripture in my theo theological condition help me explain that uh, and answer that. And also, they live accordingly to the identity of Christ. You actually live out what you believe. The question here is, how much of your theology is shaped by your culture, your church, your favorite blogger, or your denomination, rather than the scripture itself? So I'm not advocating here, never will in a class, that you have to have one specific theological framework to work within. Piedmont has one. Other schools have others. I have uh, uh, mine as well. And what I'm saying is let scripture influence your theological conviction more so than your culture, uh, more so than your church, because your church may not get everything right. Uh, your favorite blogger doesn't always get, they, they help, and they help teach, of course. Um, and even your denomination, you may disagree with some things depending on, but let scripture be that guide, and let these others be filters to help you process that. Um, so that was assessment, um, and that, like I said, that is a, a, a process where you're, being interviewed, you're being asked questions. You're, um, we were sent uh, um, about a 50 page, not 50 pages, but a, um, a questionnaire that had about 50 questions related to all these 10 categories. And we had to answer those. And when I sent it in, it was about a 50 page, about actually about a 40 something page document of all my uh, question uh, answers to their questions. And they went that, our assessors looked through that, and there were pastors and leaders from different places. Um, and then even my sending church was able to look through that report and see, you know, what, you know, uh, how am I doing in disciple making? Where am I lacking? That sort of thing. And then we went in, we came up for a retreat, an assessment retreat, where they went through everything with us, had us do some more things just to, you know, test our communication skills, test our social skills, uh, and just kind of see. Um, and that was the assessment process. And at the end of that assessment, we got either a, a, a red Red light, orange light, yellow light, or green light. Green light means you're ready to go plant. Uh, yellow light means there's a thing or two you really need to work on, so let's just have that part of your next step of mentoring. Orange light means there's a lot of caution for us to really let you go and plant right now. You probably need a few years of working on a specific area of this assessment, uh, or uh, you just need a little more mature, whatever it is. And then red light means this is not your vocational calling. We love you. It's not your calling. You're a vocational calling. Let's help you find another way to serve church planting. And uh, I've helped do the assessment retreats uh, here in Calgary. I went through it myself uh, uh, two years ago, and two and a half years ago. And uh, we've had people get all those different colors after their assessment. Um, but after your assessment, uh, and it really is a, a blessing to, to find out, okay, others affirm or not con don't confirm uh, what I think God is leading me to. Uh, but the second thing uh, we're going to talk about today, after assessment, there's some type of an apprenticeship uh, pathway. So after assessment, the potential church planter or church planting team member should take part in some sort of apprenticeship where they learn church planting principles under an experienced leader in a supportive church. So um, what I did is after we went through assessment, we moved to Calgary. The very next month, I was joined with Tapestry Church with Pastor Kelly Reed, and I did a year-long apprenticeship uh, under Pastor Kelly, and we did a lot of mentoring, a lot of helping me figure out, okay, how should we best make disciples in our new community, all these sorts of things. But I did it under his wing, so to speak. He was my mentor, but the church was all supportive. They let me preach about every five, six weeks. They let me lead some of their groups. They let me just 
really just have a good learning environment. Even though we had moved to plant this church, I was in this other church just learning and having it. And this will take different uh, ways. But there are uh, basically four types of apprenticeship pathways. Now, I say apprenticeship because I think that's the one that kind of gets you right there at the preparation. But there, th these are, um, it's kind of like a, a pyramid going down. Your mentorship, um, you kind of start with that in the early phase. A mentorship is an informal relationship with an experienced church planter to regularly meet and discuss calling, character, and capacities. I did this. I actually had several of these mentorship uh, type uh, relationships for the last seven, eight years where there are denominational leaders or my pastor or uh, former church plan, whatever it was, and I would just sit down and say, can we just have lunch? I just have a lot of questions. And it was years of doing this to find out what is God actually doing in my life? Where is he really calling me to? So all these questions helped me, but they were just mentoring and advising and loving and providing opportunity and that sort of thing. But it was a very informal relationship that I would meet uh, with, with one I met once a, once a month. We met for coffee um, and we spent about an hour and a half. And he just had questions to ask me, see how I was doing and just help me discern things. Um, the next level is kind of like an internship. Uh, I would say an internship is a short-term assignment to give exposure to the field of church planting. This may happen as you spend uh, maybe two or three months uh, in a different city helping a church plant, but then you go uh, back to your home and to your home church and sort of thing. So internship is usually short term. And maybe your, your local church says, we want to have an internship program. And it's usually used to just get that exposure to maybe see, okay, maybe we can increase the excitement for someone to want to be involved in church planting. So they go do an internship and they're paid sometimes, sometimes they're not paid. Um, but uh, they basically just give you that time to be exposed uh, uh, to uh, church planting ministry through a local church or even a, like a mission mission agency or a network. Uh, the third level is what I call a residency. This is a one to two years of learning within a church, planting church, where the potential planter is given opportunities to taste various aspects of church planting and it's also assessed in this uh, time frame which we just discussed. Um, I did a two year residency at 121 Church in Winston. And it was at that time that the elders let me do some preaching. They uh, actually said, uh, if you want to start a church one day, you should probably be able to at least start a small group. So they helped us. Um, I actually apprenticed under a small group leader for about five months and then we started our own group in our home and grew that raised up a leader and they took it over uh, so we did all that during that residency time and it was during that time that the calgary conversation came to our family where that door opened and we started exploring and so they were in the so the this church and the elders were just giving that advice, still mentoring, still helping us discern, is this the right calling? And we went through assessment during that, and the church said, yes, we affirm that this is where you need to go. And then we moved to Calgary and started the fourth level, which is an apprenticeship, which is the one to two year, depending on each church and how they want to do it. Intentional mentoring and preparation for a church planter who has passed assessment. So this is, you're ready, let's get you on a one year preparation track to get you ready to, to make this happen. All right, so these are the four levels of apprenticeship pathways uh, that I think are very, very beneficial. Um, and I would recommend you talk with your church uh, about either starting something like this, if you're a church wanting to help plant churches, start with a mentoring uh, type thing and just build that down to see what that looks like. And eventually you're sending out church planters after they finish your residency. Uh, academic platforms. This is a class um, and uh, on church planting, and you're, many of you are taking this as a degree um, there at Piedmont, and some of you are just taking it for uh, extra credit. But I think it's important to talk about academic platforms because a lot of uh, most Bible colleges, universities, Christian universities, and seminaries offer classes in church planting, both internationally and in North America, like, uh, like this class. Um, so academic platforms, it is advisable, but not always required, for potential church planters to seek some form of church planting education prior to starting a church, what you're doing with this class. This varies between sending churches, church planting networks, mission agencies, and denominations. Different ones have different requirements what they actually want to do. Some will say, yes, you have to have some type of master's degree from a seminary. Some say, you're a warm body, let's just train you. <laughs> different kind of ways of doing it. That's why it's advisable, but it's not always required. So here are the three types of learning that happen. There's a traditional, your bachelor's, your master's, doctoral classes and degrees offered through an established university, Bible college, or seminary. Um, I did not take any church planning classes at Piedmont in my undergrad, but in my master's degree at seminary, in my MDiv, I actually did a focus on my degrees actually in church planting, my concentration. Um, and then I started a PhD in North American Missiology, which is uh, related to church planting. And so uh, there's a traditional type, so you can learn a lot, and I think there's a lot of value you, um, but I don't think it's always required to do this. Um, I've met several. Uh, actually, uh, there's a, another uh, person planning a church 
um, nearby us and uh, had coffee with him a month ago to kind of discuss how we can work together and get to know him. And uh, he was a businessman with an oil company for 20 years, and then God let him go plant a church. Um, but he was a solid believer, had taught in his church, had led, and the church kind of mentored and helped prepare and things. And then now he's actually starting a church. And so um, he never went through the traditional type of education, but he still got what I would say is the non traditional type of education. Courses provided without accreditation or a degree through a local church or a church plan network or a mission agency. Uh, years ago, there was a group called Porterhouse Network that uh, basically had a, a, uh, a curriculum of sort for preparing uh, potential church planters, and you did it in a cohort base in a specific area. You paid for it. They had books. But there was no degree. Uh, there was homework. There were assignments. There were like uh, weekly video calls you had to take part in, but it was a very non-traditional way. You didn't step into a classroom at a university or seminary or Bible college. Um, it was done at a, you know inside of a local church or they met wherever. So it's just a non-traditional, but it's still academic learning. You're still learning something um, about church planting, and so there are very there are a lot of non-traditional ways, a lot of church planning networks, even churches that have their own kind of in-house training that they do. Um, I went through this training um, here in Calgary once we moved about six months. Uh, it's called the Multiply Training, and I had homework, I had reading, all that kind of stuff to do, but no, no, no degree, no course credit at the end. Um, but it truly was a great experience for me to be with those five other pastor planters doing this for six months and learning together. And then there's what, what's called learning cohorts. Uh, this is a very informal group of people with kind of common interest in church planting. You see, let's, let's get together regularly and learn from each other. Um, often, uh, a learning cohort will have an experienced person lead uh, that group. Maybe an experienced planter says, I want to get four or five of you together and let's just have you know coffee or lunch or dinner or meet once a month and let's just let's just learn from each other. Let's discuss the struggles we're having in ministry. Let's discuss best practices. And it's kind of just a cohort, but you're learning together. Um, so often they have an experienced person kind of lead it. Um, but there's no requirement. If you can't come, you can't come. Uh, there's no graduation. There's no homework or anything really. But sometimes they may or may not follow a curriculum. A lot of times it's, hey, we want to read through these two books and discuss them together. Um, or we have this curriculum, uh, Professor Dustin Connors' curriculum on church planning. We want to just go watch the videos and discuss it, whatever it is. Um, no one's doing that, by the way, but uh, it's fun to throw it out. Um, but a linear work, very informal group. So these are the kind of three different types of academic and learning platforms I think are very valuable. And I don't think uh, a potential church planter or someone wanting to be involved in church planting has to do all three of these, uh, not by any means. But I think there's value in each of these at different uh, levels and stages of your ministry preparation. And then lastly, affirming persons. You've gone through assessments. You've had a bunch of people ask you a bunch of questions about those 10 areas of life. Um, you have uh, looked at these kind of apprenticing pathways. You've been mentored. Maybe you've done an internship or residency, whichever. Um, and you've gone through some type of academic learning of something. And then at the end of the day, and these kind of cross over, at the end of the day, you're like, well, does anyone else think I'm actually ready to do this? You know, the question is, am I called and ready uh, to plant churches? So we, don't, we want to talk about affirming persons. Whether during an assessment, a residency, an apprenticeship, or even in the classroom, the potential church planter or church planting team member uh, should listen to the affirmations and the admonishment of those who care for their well-being and call to a church planting ministry. You know, there were there were many in uh, my early years, like a residency, where my pastor says, "Dustin, you're not ready." That was an admonishment. It was kind of like a warning, like, "Hey, you're 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 not ready. You need another year or two." I had that told to me, and it was tough to hear. So I was like, I'm ready to go do this. And they sat me down and said, not yet. Let's let's do this to help you get to that point. And two years later, um, after I'd gone through a lot of experience with it, they said, yes, we affirm you need to go. And they helped send us here to Calgary. Uh, so you're looking for affirming persons along the way. Um, and you also want to listen to those who are saying, I think you should wait, or I don't think that's your calling. Now, you may have one person saying that and 20 saying the other, um, or they may be switched. So I want to say is listen to all those conversations. Some may have ulterior motives. Um, and all the time of us moving to Calgary, I only had one person give me an admonishment or uh, say, I don't really think it. And turns out they kind of wanted me to stay doing the ministry I was doing with them. Um, they didn't want me to go. But then he said, well, God calls you. You got to go. Um, but it was the only negative family, friends, pastors, um, the the 
administration and other faculty members and staff at Piedmont were all affirming because uh, I was working. I was actually working there on campus at Piedmont when I went through this assessment um, and exploring to move to Calgary. And so I was hopping into people's offices, uh, in the business office or in student services, whatever, saying, "Here's what's happening. Do you even see this?" Or, or someone will come and say, "I think this is. I think this is right for you. I think this is where God is leading you." Um, so. Who should affirm? Well, those you've ministered under, pastors, other leaders, and so forth. Those you've ministered alongside of, members, other members of your local church or your small group. Those you've ministered to inside the church, those that you've helped disciple, those you've helped uh, lead, and so forth. And those you've ministered to outside the church. Do you have any lost friends who say, yep, you need to go do that? And also those who've watched you minister to others from a distance, whether it's a digital distance or they just hear about you from... Uh, you know, the, the, they know your pastor and he's been sharing a lot. And they're like, yeah, I, I kind of see based on what they say. Some of you are watching from a distance and they may also affirm you as well. So here are the four things that we discussed today. The assessment process, apprenticing pathways, academic platforms, and affirming persons, all to help you get ready to plant new churches. So let's apply this briefly as we close. Apply this to the 12 disciples. Um, the assessment process, Jesus was constantly asking them questions before and while they followed him. Uh, he was blunt with his challenges to them and even his questions and you know, challenging their answers, but he always, always was gracious in his response. You see that there was a bit of an assessment that the disciples even went through uh, while they were walking with Jesus. Um, they went through kind of what I would say is an apprenticing pathway. They, the 12 had a three-year apprenticeship where they followed Jesus and were given opportunities to practice under his mentorship what they had learned. I think of Luke 10 when he sent them out um, to the different uh, villages um, and many others, of course, as well. They had an academic platform. They sat at Jesus' feet every day, which is far greater than any Bible college class or uh, uh, Bible college class on theology or church planting. And they also had affirming persons. After adequately preparing the 12, Jesus was confident he could lead them to carry on the mission and he encouraged them to do so with the Great Commission. I mean, think about this. Jesus did not plant a church. He raised up 12 disciples who filled saturated a whole geographical region uh, with the gospel um, and he left it in their hands because he knew and they were affirm. he said I give you my spirit and with you always that was the affirmation that they needed let's apply it to you uh, if you're a potential church planter, then be willing to humbly submit to an assessment process and seek good mentors let them help you walk through uh, these four areas from assessment to the uh, apprenticeship pathways, through even some academic learning, uh, and then also seeking those affirmations. Um, if you're a church planting team member, though you may not be the lead church planter, you should still prepare in similar fashion for church planting work. Uh, we have a team member that came with us. She did not have to go through this full assessment, but she did go through a smaller assessment and a smaller level of training. And then we've done a lot of things here uh, because her job is not to be the lead church planter, but she is a support person. She is a team member. Uh, so though you may not be the lead church planter, you still should have some of these areas uh, that you're going through as well. And if you're a potential sending pastor, you're the pastor of a church or um, you're, you're a missions committee um, um, director there at your church and you're not actually uh, like pastoral staff, but you have a heart for missions and church planting, you're that potential sending pastor or person. Always be looking for potential church planters and team members in your congregation and send out your best. Be willing to mentor, prepare, send, and care for them. So always be looking out for that. You've given the, we've given you this platform, the assessment. Um, and if you want a sample of okay, what are the what are the full assessment questions that we need to ask? There's so many different denomination and agencies and mission boards that have samples from that. Other churches, um, I have some as well, and can uh, definitely uh, get those uh, to you. So. Um, so thanks for uh, paying attention today and uh, hope that this was helpful uh, in looking at what does it take to, to know that I'm really called and ready uh, to go and plant churches.